Coming to me live from the future, it's Steve the Teacher. Steve the Teacher. What's up, man? <laughs> Hello, how are you? Good to see you. It's been a, quite a while. I uh, Dude, I miss you, bro. I yeah, miss you, bro. Way back, way back. So far back. You know, it's... It, it felt really important to me to make sure I got uh, some conversation on the record with you, man. I mean, the, I think, um, I think it's important for me to say on the record before anything else, I want to make sure you feel very uh, safe, welcome and, 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 and free, you know, and you're just, you're just, I, I want to see and hear you. And I for sure want you to feel free of judgment and absolutely heard. I want you to be heard and I want you to be seen. I want to let you know off off the on the record just right off the hook. The reason that I wanted to have you on is because I I'll go back through my Rolodex of people who've made impacts in my life. And I will say on the record the the type of impact that you had and the amount of love that I have for you, because when I was coming through, when I was coming through, I was a, I was a kid, dude. I didn't have very many, many male role models. I didn't have a lot of those as a kid, but I saw, I saw you with determination. I saw you with, with just in, inspirational amount of like will to complete this task of being a professional wrestler and i wow and it inspired me, it inspired me. wow <laughs> i don't know what to say to that uh i'm very humbled um uh, yeah i started late 34 years old was when i started well actually 33 when i started trading 34 first match you know um, what's funny but when we met know. that was old to me that was old as shit to me back then <laughs> i was i was but like 15 or something hurt. You were the first one. Even if you started one day before me, you were there longer. So I did try and show um, as much respect as possible um, and learn what I could from you. You were doing great stuff then. So uh, we did some practice matches, I, I recall. Um, yeah. Although I ended up with, uh, I don't know if you remember Jeff. I partnered with him quite the often. Guy, while the training. guy who looked like Frazier, right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Each individual. I tried to befriend him. I tried to take him under my wing. I got him booked on three or four shows. I got him booked for World Star Wrestling against Jimmy Snuka. And the day of the show, Steve, I can't go. My work is having a barbecue. I'd rather go there. What? <laughs> I can't believe that. It's like, it's like oh uh, bro, all I'm do, all I'm ever doing is trying to stick my neck out for y'all sometimes. Yeah. And then you come up with an excuse like, I got some work barbecue that I got to go to. Or like, or like uh, I might be booked somewhere else. I'm going to go there and I'm going to bring my bag. I'm like, I am promising you a booking. You're absolutely going to be booked. And you'll be somewhere that's close to the main event. But you know what? Go take a booking where you might get booked. Go beg your way onto some show that may or may not have you on. And is it, it's, it's a gamble. It's a full, full on who knows. You know, when I think back on those times at the uh, CZW dojo, um, one of my favorite moments uh, was actually when um, Alex was in the ring hmm. and uh, some kids were walking by and they were screaming, Hey, that's Abdullah the butcher. And I absolutely thought that was the funniest thing. Alex, you're talking about um, the crossbones guy? Uh, the tattoo artist, the piercer? Yeah, yeah. Wax's friend at one point? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what happened to that guy. I still see him on Facebook quite frequently. I helped him design his latest uh, training plan. He wants to get back into shape. 
I remember really liking him. Yeah, he was a great guy. Everything was funny to him. And yeah, they, he looked like Buddha. Yeah. He was a great so, guy. So why don't you why don't you walk me and whoever's listening or watching through what your last few years have been like? Okay. Uh well I did retire from wrestling. Uh we're probably going back 10 years at this point. Um, I was wrestling for Tommy. I always get those two Tommies mixed up. Tommy Cairo. uh, Force One Wrestling against, uh, oh, God. I can't believe I don't remember his name. Uh, Jaden was his manager. Tommy Force. Okay. Okay. uh, I went to do my uh, swanton off the top. He rolled the wrong way. I adjusted midair, gave myself a concussion. He put me in a figure four and tore my meniscus. And I said, yeah, no, uh, driving this far for $20 to come back with these two injuries, having the drive alone. So I stopped. Uh, then I made it. I got to close the door. These dogs are fucking. Excuse me. Uh, about six years later, a friend of mine, uh, Ralph Ray from RPWF, um, said that he's doing a show. I was their champion. I retired at that point. And uh, it's been six years. He said, Steve, uh, we need you. Uh, The people are asking about you all the time. I put on 80, 90 pounds at that point. Um, But I said, I do him a favor. I went the night before. I worked out in his ring for about 10 minutes. Um, There was no opponent that showed up for me. Nobody remembered me whatsoever. (laughs) <laughs> wait for the pop wait for the big pop to come oh yeah people ask me about you all the time. Uh, I was blown up at the end of the first spot I was then wrestling a 19 year old uh, Ty Awesome who was running okay. circles around me oh my god uh, some fan screamed get him some Geritol so I, I re-retired after that match um, <laughs> that's from my teaching career moved to China I was finding my own business for about a year. Then that same Jaden who I mentioned before mentioned a Chinese federation he heard about. I emailed the promoter, um, who was an American. um, And the guy was willing to take a chance on a 55-year-old, ring rusty, overweight guy who was never really that good in his prime, whatever my prime was. Um, so he brought me in to do a one minute spot in a rumble, um, and no promises. A few months later, he brought me in for a one minute run in on the other side of the country. And then after that, I became a regular roster member. So I was there for the last three years, um, had some interesting matches with some opponents of all levels. I, uh, I, I, I want to hear it all. I, I, I'm yeah. interested in all of it. Uh, well, one of my first... This is all opponents. stuff I didn't know, by the way. Black Mamba was one of the first opponents that I had. He's the trainer over there in the Chinese school. Um, decent match. Um, his English is not good, so it was a lot of feel. Um, and then I was booked for um, another... We're actually doing a series of shows because that's when Corona kicked in. So we were taping three shows a night for three straight days or four shows a night. Mm -hmm. So um, the guy who I wrestled in the second episode broke his ankle in the first match and uh, didn't want to step away. So uh, I was supposed to wrestle him. He's another big guy. He looks like a sumo wrestler. His name is Saga. Uh, So the promoter uh, asked me to uh, put him over with a clothesline in 15 seconds. And I said, (laughs) I've never argued a finish before, but um, I've traveled way too far. Um, yeah, I understand he's hurt, but then take him out of the match. Give me somebody else. I, I came here all the way from New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> I came here all the Pretty way from New Jersey to do the job to a guy with a broken ankle off of a clothesline. What a- and I, I convinced him, though, and I had people supporting me. There was a, a British wrestler, Big Sam, who always supports me. Um, it didn't make sense. Um, 
how are you going to bring me back? So I pitched an idea that I thought made us both look strong. He came out selling the ankle. I was introduced. When it was back, when his back was turned, I took out his knee. I put him in the figure four. And instead, the match was over in 15 seconds with me going over. But at least when he recovers, he can come after me. Listen to this politicker, this guy over here, politicking to yeah. get himself put over. There was only one other time when I did that, when it was my uh, first retirement match. <laughs> so, do, <clears throat> did you have to, like, get all new gear? I did because they changed the gimmick slightly. Yeah. Um, to Steve the ESL teacher instead of Steve the teacher. Yeah, so like so English is the second language. Is that what you were yeah. is that what you were doing for a shoot? Yeah, that's what pretty much any foreigner in China does. Um, and as long as you come from the right country, they don't care about your qualifications, which I am fully qualified. I have been teaching 30 years at that point. Right. But it was frustrating to be teaching and the guy in the desk next to me was um, a cashier at Walmart. <laughs> you got you got the same credentials and the same pay. <laughs> um, but I did um, some other matches. Uh, we did a lot of matches in shopping malls, which uh, actually went over pretty well. Um, when we did the show in Shenzhen, which is on the other side of China, um, there's a good foreign population there and they were uh, popping for the heel. Uh, so that's always good for me. Um well when, when when working show when working shows in um in China, can you just do a lot of like suckets and like two sweets and stuff, and then like the fans will go nuts for that stuff? Yeah, but keeping with the character too, I did a lot of he's stupid, he's not as smart as me kind of thing. I used to bring flash cards. I brought name tags. Hello, my name is, and I wrote idiot, failure, loser, and just put them on their chests. I uh, brought in uh, textbooks and read uh, to them and did uh, silly children's songs, the wheels on the bus, and well, like, 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 like Andy Sam, like <laughs> Andy Kaufman reading reading the book to the people in the in Man on the Moon when he was reading when he was reading the whole book and people were all falling asleep and everybody left. He walked the room completely. Well, he did it straight face. Uh, yeah, I think it was, yeah. um, it was the the book. The, the oh God, the Great Gatsby. He was reading. No, the Great Gatsby. That's the one. Uh, yeah. But I was reading like three-year-old preschool books, condescendingly. <laughs> condescendingly. And the flashcards, like right in the wrestlers' faces, trying to teach all the Chinese wrestlers an English lesson. I will not eat it in a boat. <laughs> I exactly. will not. <laughs> <laughs> green, green eggs and ham but I ended up doing um, a storyline that lasted nine months TV time which we actually filmed over um, three weekends uh, in which I recruited a reluctant student and was going to serve as his mentor but uh, of course he and I never saw eye to eye and I would just slap him around and you know, learn from my experience and sometimes we'd be in a tag team sometimes we'd escort each other to the ring um and i was trying to get him to take dirty tactics um to be more like me and to be more of a winner and that finally exploded and then it culminated in a um classroom rules hardcore match <laughs> so anything that you would find in a classroom could be used as a weapon did you hear the sad news about yardsticks? I did not. They're not going to make them any longer. Uh, I did see that on Facebook, yeah. I have one guy on Facebook who all he does is puns. <laughs> <laughs> I used one of those, by the way. But in Asia, it's a meter stick. Oh, yeah. You oh. got the, the metric system over there. Yeah. Then I was using a whiteboard. Um, I carved them up with a pencil, a compass. Um, erasers with the chalk dust. So, so now, now you're not in China anymore. No, I actually made a pit stop in Cambodia. I was there for three months while I waited for the Philippine borders to open. Um, meanwhile, my wife um, 
had left from China and she's a Philippine citizen. So she went straight to the Philippines um, and waited for me. Um, I had a teaching job in Cambodia. I enjoyed being in Cambodia, but as soon as I heard the borders were open, it was um, a Friday afternoon and I was on the plane by Monday. Is there, do they have like crazy like mask mandates or anything like that over there? Um, actually the government is in the process of revoking all of it in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people here are still wearing it out of habit when they're in the cities, mm -hmm. but I'm in the countryside and most people don't wear it unless they're like in a government office or something. Well, no, also, one also states, so it makes sense that I said, uh, uh, calling, calling in from the future, Steve, the teacher, because you're 12 hours 12 hours ahead of us oh yes i was gonna do a quick um marty we gotta save your son but i didn't think it was quick enough roads where we're going we don't need roads <laughs> yes yeah, so i've been here since february 12th and uh definitely the right choice <clears throat> so so Is there is there a way that you can wrestle in the Philippines at all? Is there a is there a, a, an indie scene at all? Does a wrestling environment exist? There is a small wrestling scene. To the best of my knowledge, there's three federations, but they work with each other. At first, they were feuding, and now they have some kind of agreement. Um, a big name in this area, uh, Chili Willie. Uh, in fact, uh, the the penguin from Woody Woodpecker. Uh, no, the ECW one with the blonde hair. <laughs> but that used to be my favorite cartoon character, by the way. He used to cry ice cubes. And but, he used um, to say, ha, he, ha, chew. Oh, yes. Yeah. Going backwards, um, <laughs> my very first match was in Brooklyn, New York, LIWF, Doghouse, while I was still training at CZW. Um, actually, that was one of the, the nicest things that uh, the trainers had ever said to me when I showed them the videotape. They said, oh, that wasn't bad for a first match. The guy didn't sell for you, but that's not your fault. Um, but anyway. Talk about uh, me. <laughs> Talk about me. Uh, no, my opponent did Long Island Wrestling Federation. Oh. But um, I was there, um, and a lot of the guys who were working for um, Jersey All Pro and JCW and all the – and ICW at the time, they would appear at the doghouse because they ran on Fridays every single week. So they would just get in match time there. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys was, uh, in fact, he did wrestle at CCW. Um, All Money is Legal. I don't know if you recall that tag team. Yeah, um, me, me and Jeff used to job to those guys in CCW. Ah. We, they, were, they were brought in just so that we could job. We could, they could, job. <laughs> we could put them over. They came in just to so we could put them over that was we we were the designated let's get your teams that aren't from here over ah that's what i am in china by the way or, or was <laughs> so he was in the locker room that night my very first match ever and then he was in the locker room in my very first china match 18 years later oh yeah so that was a great so which, he's the which, one who which one was it uh well now he goes by bufa um I'm not sure if he was murder or pusher, to be honest okay. with you. One of those two. But um, he, he's, over, he's over there wrestling in China now? He actually just left. He, he did some time in Japan first. Now he's based out of Scotland. But uh, he's been in Germany. He's England. He's all over Europe now. But it's, but it's pretty rad to uh, have uh, something I, I've always had on my bucket list is like wrestling internationally. It's not something I've ever done. I haven't wrestled in any other country besides the United States. It's something I've always wanted to do, but never had an opportunity to. So it's really cool that you were able to knock something off my bucket list. Well, I wrestled in West Virginia. Does that count as outside the U.S.? <laughs> I think I think if you said that in West Virginia, you'd get booed. You'd get you'd get uh, good heat. I had three matches there, and each one was worse. Each not the match, the shows were worse than the other. Dude, I had a I had a show in West Virginia once 
where um, it was a kind of barn and it was freezing cold. It was in a barn that was like heated by like these like jet engine heaters. You know, those like jet engine heaters. Yeah. And the, 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 the heat, like the heat was escaping my body the whole time. And it was in a barn, in a barn that was a barn heated. Was yeah. And <laughs> it was, it was like this, the same like scratch your head. What the hell am I getting myself into? Why did I come all the way to West Virginia to, to, to wrestle? Like I'm such a mark for my own. Yeah. Self. Oh, me too. Yeah. That, it was a horrible uh, experience. Eric Shea convinced me to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to pick him up in Maryland on the way, he couldn't go. Oh. So I ended up going by myself in the snow, six hours altogether. It was at this, I want to call it a lodge. I mean, it was like a bar, but with like a deck and um, an outdoor deck. And um, the Gemini twins were there, also from DCW. I trained with them. Yeah. Uh, um, and then um, I heard they're not, uh, they're not buff anymore. Ah, those guys, those guys, I heard they're not any, they're not buff anymore. I lost contact a long time ago. Yeah, same. I, yeah. The, the last time, the last time I had any interactions with them was, uh, they were doing the, the German third right gimmick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the like skinhead Nazi gimmick. And, uh, me and, me and Bomboy, me and Matt Bomboy, uh, had a match against them in, uh, on a ballpark in the rain. In Delaware for DCW. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so that show in, in it was Mound, West Virginia. Um, it was supposed to be an afternoon show. It didn't start until the evening. Uh, New Jack was on the card, and uh, he showed up backstage in the locker room, which was just the outside deck. And oh my god, you know, people criticize me because I speak poor of the dead sometimes, but I don't think dying gives you a, a clean slate. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, dude. If you're if you're a dick, you're you're a dick whether you're a live dick or you're a dead dick. Yeah, he was pissing over the edge of the deck, and then um, they put him in with this 17 year old kid who was training for two weeks. Nice kid, green as hell, obviously. Did he stab him? Uh, multiple times. Yeah, he because he had the audacity to call a spot. And, uh, yeah, it, it just wasn't a pleasant experience for me. Um, and I, I worked with him two other times, and it was not good. Um, I never worked against him, but no. we were on the same side. Uh, and, um, speaking of the Gemini twins um, with the German gimmick, I had wrestled them in Triple WA. And um, one of them, because they are identical twins, uh, kicked me pretty stiff in the head accidentally. Mm -hmm. And the other one comes into the ring. Steve, uh Calm down, relax. Take. Uh, I'll just give you time. And he was like drawing with the crowd, which was pretty cool. Because he knew I got hit harder than what was intended. One of them, one of them in that match that I was talking about, that was in the rain, stuck his finger directly in my eye and knocked my contact lens out. Oh boy! And I wrestled one eye for the rest of the match, and I, I want to never have that experience again. The last time I wrestled with contacts was training in CZW Dojo. It got knocked out. I couldn't find it. I showed up the very next night, found it, and put it in my eye, and Dahmer almost threw up. Yeah, that seems like a – that's puke-worthy. I've always been that way. Uh, as a teacher, I would leave my coffee on my desk on Friday, come back Monday morning, and drink it. And I'm teaching in Camden. And the kids are going, oh, that's gross. I'm like, I thought you guys were supposed to be tough. It well, I mean, like that I mean, drink, drinking, drinking, drinking days old coffee isn't as gross as sticking a contact that was in a disgusting ring. Yeah. Back in your eye. Did you like wash yeah. it out first? Because I can imagine no, you could like was, get an infection. It was all crunchy. <laughs> it was wrinkly and crunchy. I know a trick that I used to do was like. Pop it in your mouth so it's wet again, and then pop it in your eye. Makes sense. Ah, oh, this guy is annoying me. 
Oh, there's a doggy. There's a doggy. Yeah. Doggy. Too loud. Get away from me, Toby. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, the second time I had a incident with um, New Jack, I was working on um, ACPW or ACW in mm-hmm. Northern Philly. Northeast Philly. And, uh, Jim and I, yeah. Yeah, Jim and I brought him in unannounced as the new booker, and he had a meeting with us all. And yeah, he's it? screaming yeah. about how unprofessional these workers are. And um, none of you have boots and you don't have proper gear. You should look like this guy. And he's pointing at me. And I'm like, I'm like the least skilled employee here. Um, don't use me as a role model. Yeah, I was, th- I was there for that. <laughs> so, I was, um, so I've told this story on this podcast a few times, but in regards to New Jack's supposed to be like, the booker is is it like the, the the go-to move to grab some guy who used to be an ECW and make him the booker of your wrestling company? Like it seemed like for a while there in the Northeast, everybody was kind of doing that. But yeah, yeah and uh, in fact, I had um, an argument with the uh, the Philippine wrestling guy uh, who uh, he's been wrestling a total of three years, the booker there, and he thinks that he he's a twenty five year old kid who knows everything. Um, and he said, hey, I wrestled Tajiri. And I went, well, wrestling Tajiri in Asia is like bringing in C.W. Anderson or um, Little Guido to your show. It's 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 not a big deal. <laughs> I you mean, a hundred bucks, they're coming in. My, I mean, being able to wrestle Tajiri is probably pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you're I mean, doing... Like, I wouldn't compare to wrestling Tajiri to wrestling C.W. Anderson... Yeah, um, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh, but I, I mean, yeah. you've had dealings with Helter Skelter, right? Yeah, dude, I love Helter. Um, well, I heard he became a stand-up guy, but when I was involved with him, he was just paying people to uh, job to him. Sid Vicious, Bundy, people on that level. Well, I think Rocky was very much taken advantage of by people who were... were, were um, stealing the house based on his money right you know so like they they like advertise a advertise a talent and then have him pay the guy to come work so they'll put that person's face on the flyer in order to put asses in seats but then the guy's gonna have a dog shit match against somebody who can barely work yeah um in fact he was working bundy that night in reading and um they told me to go in and uh, help beat down Bundy with him. Mm-hmm. And then the whole mm-hmm. locker room emptied. And uh, Ron Starr grabbed me back of the head and said, Steve, you don't want to be here for this. Threw me over the top rope. And they all shot on him. That's sad, dude. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's not, he doesn't have ill intentions in any way. Like the guy, yeah. the guy's the sweetest guy. And all he's ever wanted to do was be a wrestler. Be a wrestler. But he, didn't have the the resources to learn how to be a good wrestler and he didn't start at a young enough age and maybe he didn't have the the the, the skill or the the social skills to like yeah to i think that's i think you said on that last description yeah right the the yeah because uh, after the match um he he heard that i live just outside of philly i go into my vehicle and he's in the back seat already can you can you take me home and i'm like uh what? <laughs> he was in your car. He was in my car waiting for me, and then he didn't even give me gas money. And uh, it wasn't the nicest section of Philly. I'm like, you just paid Bundy six hundred bucks. You can't give me a ten for gas. That was when gas was a little more reasonably priced. Yeah, I know. I know where he lives. I've been to his place. Tasker, I think it was. Yeah, I, I've been there. I know, I know where it is. But yeah. Uh... <laughs> That's like that that's the street my girlfriend's dad lives on. Ah. I think Tasker, <laughs> South Philly. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's uh it's 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 funny to like pull up this kind of like this this old like it's very very um very niche, very niche like knowledge of like indie wrestling from the early 2000s 
Yeah. But uh, I'm sure you remember uh, that you were part of my uh, departure from CZW. Yeah, I was. I was there. I, was there. I, I, I recall <laughs> I, it very recall much. It very yeah, I, I think about that. But what most people don't know is the real reason that happened after I got eliminated from that battle royal um, is when I walked back to, we were changing in a truck mm -hmm. um, in Vineland, and I overheard one of the people, I don't want to embarrass them, but one of the trainers refer to that Jew boy. And that that's the real reason why I disappeared after that. Um, and then how many years later did I get an opportunity to return thanks to Maven? A one night only thing, but um, it was, I didn't uh, know that you did. I didn't know that you had a had a return. Yeah, it was uh, a small show. It was at a strip bar. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the Jersey town. I think it was the, the other end of Vineland, but it was like a long distance away from there. It was called Kashmir. Oh, um, okay. It was like a strip club, right? was doing the gimmick where he was like impersonating another wrestler each and every show. Right. And from what I heard, there was some kind of auction um, and the winner got to choose who he would portray. And for whatever reason, the person picked me. So he figured maybe he can bring me in. And um, we were going to do a match together. And then um, he decided against it, I, I think. And I might be wrong here that he, he didn't he wasn't trained at that point or no he was training he was training when we were training wasn't he yeah. i don't remember him i but whatever I, he put up bruce in I, I i don't remember bruce was the bouncer at that bar um right. i i wrestled him under his um samoan gimmick a few times before that you know bruce bruce was on this podcast i had him on the podcast a couple years ago um his he he lives in vegas now He's a he's a comedian in Vegas. Uh, he was a sharp guy. I mean, I got that yeah, doesn't surprise. He came back home to like visit his mom or something, and then him and I went to went to some comedy clubs and hung out, and then came back here and recorded an episode of the podcast. What was the gimmick? Was it Kahuna? Something something similar to that. Not Mike Kalua, but something close to that. Don't get me lying, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to act like I know because uh, I have fucking no idea. Yeah. Good guy. Good guy. What's like that afterwards, um, I remember uh, Z-Bar asked me to buy him a shot at the club, and I ended up buying him two, and then he walked out. But <laughs> and that guy's dead now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think it was a pleasant situation. I, he was very depressed for a long time on Facebook. And yeah. then I just stopped hearing from him. So I put two and two together. I could be completely wrong, but that's what I thought. You're not. Something about his mother um, broke up his relationship with his girlfriend. I hadn't heard any. I hadn't heard too many details on it, but I'm still I'm still close friends with Nick Burke. And I know he was really, really rat rattled about the whole thing because him and Barr were friends for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And but I mean, like, soft. for a little while, dude, uh, I'd have to say, like, you, you remember when I started the CCW school, I was 15 years old. You know, like, I, yeah. I didn't um, – when I first started, the only trainer was Dahmer and, and Rick. And Rick. The, the only – well, Rick was the, tra was the other trainee. Connor, Rick Feinberg, oh, okay. they're, they were the only ones. So I didn't get to do any, I didn't get to do any offensive moves. Like I wasn't, I never picked anybody up. All I ever did was I was a bump dummy for my first like six months of training. This was pre Valentine. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then, and then, um, and then, um, then bar started coming down to this and, Bar started teaching me stuff. So, when it comes to me talking about like people who were important to me at at certain times, like when I needed, like he 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 stepped up for me in a, a lot of good ways, ver, mm -hmm. like comparatively a lot of bad ways too. He, I think he he was so on the edge of sabotaging everything always. Yeah. 
So the fact that like he's not in misery anymore, there's this kind of really a relief. He actually ended up getting me booked in a match that I wasn't booked for. Doc Diamond was running in Browns Mills. It was a, a daytime show, and it was him against um, Mana. Okay. Um, from X, uh, WXW. Um, and he didn't want to take the finish, so they just decided to make it a three-way. At that point, I was, like, just fearless. I'm not going to say young and fearless, but just stupidly <laughs> fearless. And, and whatever anyone called was fine with me. It wasn't a bad finish, so I, I have to admit. What was working that was with Mana like? like? Oh, he, he's such a soft-spoken guy. Um he was dating uh, Cindy Rogers at the time, and uh, he had very strong religious and moral feelings, so um, there wasn't, like, a physical quality to it. He was a very soft-spoken guy. Um, I remember we were doing a match in WP, uh, WXW, excuse me, too many initials. Alphabet and, um, soup. Yeah. He, he bladed, which was against Alpha's policy, and he, uh, he sliced his artery in his head. So he was like staggering around and he uh, basically fell into my daughter's lap, a bloody mess. And and then he stopped getting booked because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, so, uh, I know that like, I, I don't think I've ever met the guy, but I know that Matt Bomboy speaks very highly of him. I know that um, Matt, Matt was close friends with him at one point. I don't, I think he kind of, I think he is in a wheelchair now. I don't. I don't really. I don't really have a whole lot of information, so I don't want to really misspeak. But I know him and Matt were friends. That doesn't surprise me either, because I remember um, maybe because of his weight, but his ankles and feet were like a horror story. So, if there's like diabetes or some kind of circulation issue, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Mm -hmm. Sweet man, very sweet. Yeah, that's what. That's what I. Uh, secondhand, I heard that. I heard that all the time. It's 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 it seems like it's more rare to hear about somebody in wrestling being good, being a good person, being uh, kind, and being uh, nice. That seems yeah. pretty rare. I, 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 I have to say, I, I've met a lot of good people along the way. And... Well, I mean, usually, usually like, that kind of reputation doesn't really precede anyone. Right. Yeah. Like, that's something you'll find out. By uh, like, by experience with some people, like I could definitely say that about Zach Connor. <laughs> Julius Caesar said something to the effect that the uh, the good gets buried with you, but the evil lives forever. I'm paraphrasing. Well, you're a teacher. You shouldn't paraphrase. You should quote <laughs> verbatim. Oh yeah. You know, show, show your I was really cruising the last four or five years of my teaching career. I was uh, heading towards the finish line. <laughs> yeah, the, the senioritis. Yeah, for about five or six years. What was your what was your favorite grade to teach? Um, ninth or tenth grade normally. I always tried to make ninth grade was Romeo and Juliet, tenth grade was Julius Caesar, and always teaching in an urban setting. I tried to make it as real as possible. Um, and I probably came off as um, Brian Griffin did when he taught in um, an urban setting school. Yeah, man, that's just racist. Dude. It's like, it was a like dangerous minds situation. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, I never took things too seriously. I wasn't like... Uh, stand and deliver or anything like that but just someone that they could relate to someone that they could trust but not like over spiritual or motivational or... well i mean like there's probably there's probably so many like people people don't really take time to find what the commonalities would be well, there's probably so many more commonalities uh, between you and those kids than they're even aware of. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, and it's your job to teach them what those are. Oh, yeah. These kids were always saying, you really need to stop watching Family Guy. They're telling me this. and Because I could pull Family Guy or Simpsons into any lesson or example. 
do, do you still watch do pro wrestling? Watch pro wrestling? Um, I do. Um, basically, the the PLE, the prime, what do they call premium live events? <laughs> um, other than that, it's I'm just watching um, YouTube and uh, watching the shows that do the uh, the news about wrestling. Does do do the Philippines get Peacock? Um, I think they still get the network. You, yeah, that's but, what, uh, that was my that was going to be the second part of that question. So you still probably get the WWE Network there. Huh? I would assume so, but um, what's it? Eric Pinhack from the Diamond City Machines up in Northeast Pennsylvania a long time ago told me about this little website called Watch Wrestling, mm. and I can watch everything there. <laughs> I think I'm out of the uh, jurisdiction of the FBI on that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're pirating pro wrestling, but pirating is uh, who's who's keeping track? Who's keeping yeah. track? Are I'm probably wanted in China for walking out of my contract anyway. So who cares? You walked out of your teaching contract in China. Yeah, I had a month and a half to go, and I had another job lined up, and I hated the school that much that I went to Cambodia. I couldn't see myself finishing another month and a half there. So, in these countries, in these countries what's the what's the pooping what's situation, the pooping situation like? like? Um, <laughs> they will squat over a hole. But most of the apartments are Western toilet friendly. All of the apartments that I've had, anyway. But if you go to a bar, it's a it's a crapshoot. <laughs> Literally. Oh no, yeah, <laughs> I didn't even catch that. <laughs> and being drunk is probably the worst time to have to aim that. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. What would you call that? Shaccuracy. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, I mean, it probably takes a while to to acquire that skill. I would guess so. Um, in the Philippines, the first place that we stayed at had Western toilets, but not um, automatic plumbing. So you had a small bucket, and you would just pour water over it and activate the flush mechanism. I had um. I had a girl in the podcast a couple years ago who who had spent time in Thailand, I think. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how they didn't have she said they had like they had she called them bum guns. It was like a bidet that they it it spray your spray your bung and then you just wipe it dry and throw that in the trash. I think that was. Uh, well, we have an attachment for that. We've never used it because it's got a leaky hose. It's just like the one that we have is like, um, like when you're washing your dishes and you know you have that spray gun. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like it, it's been a, a plumbing issue since before we got there. So, but yeah, um, flushing of paper is not recommended. Yeah, it seems. Uh, it seems like it's a recipe for. Uh, a flood? Uh, no, it's in the wastebasket. Uh, but it's a. Uh, you go through a lot of air freshener. I was gonna say, doesn't your like bathroom stink all the time? For some reason, no. I don't know why. And um, if people know the amount of protein I consume daily, that's even more shocking. I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, in fact, you, you can ask my buddy Breaker about a drive we had up to uh, northeast Pennsylvania when I was uh, snacking on protein bars. He'll, he'll tell you. You know the Breaker? is really funny. Uh, very recently, I found out that Breaker's wife is my girlfriend's godmother. Oh, wow. And I, and I, I texted him. I texted Matt. Yeah. And I, was like, I was like, hey, my, I was like, my girlfriend... My girlfriend's godmother is your wife. And he said, oh, yeah, who's your girlfriend? And I was like, Alyssa. And then he didn't say anything back. And I don't think I've talked to him again since then. Oh, boy. But, yeah, he's been with her since high school. What's that? 
Him and me have been together since high school. Him and you and Breaker? No, uh, his wife, Mia. Oh, oh. I thought you said <laughs> him and me have been together since high school. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. You guys aren't the same age. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, uh, one of my early matches with um, another UWF based out of Delaware at that point. Um, no, Oxford, Pennsylvania, but the show was in Delaware. Um, it was my second booking with them. Uh, Jeff Rocker got me in with them. And um, they didn't have a match for me, so they made me the ref. It was an outdoor show um, in July, and there was no other ref. So I was, in, I was actually getting pops because the fans appreciated that I was with them the whole time. Um, and the main event was Breaker against um, Midnight. And I had never met Breaker at that point. Um, and that yeah, was, that was when he had his long hair and stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we became very close friends and driving partners for many, many, many years. But at that point, I, as we're in the ring, I, what's your finish? Breaker driver. I'm like, what the fuck is the breaker driver? <laughs> I've had that with a few people. Um, is it Death Valley driver? Uh, I think it was. I don't even remember. But uh, I remember I was wrestling WPW. Um, in my Japanese gimmick, and uh, I was wrestling Molson, and we didn't even talk the match at all. I said, "What's the finish?" And he goes, "Molson down." I'm like, "What? The I don't know what that is. I don't follow you that closely." Does Give that me mean, the real does that, that mean that I'm over now? Does that mean you're putting me over? Is that what you uh, down means? Me over? A, a variation of a spine buster. Um, I gigged. I gigged <laughs> once. In wrestling, right here. Can you see that? No scar. I'm on a small screen, though. I was up. It was. I had been wrestling already 13 years, and I had never been led in a match. But I, I was like, I was going to be wrestling Matt. I was going to be wrestling Breaker, and I know that like he had experience with that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to let I'm going to let him gig me because I know he had done it before for Chris, Chris Wild. So he um. Uh, Tony Stetson. Do you know Tony Stetson? Tony Stetson had given yeah. Breaker ECW. scalpels. And Breaker, he popped me right there, and uh, I guess it hit something, and I just never stopped bleeding. And the ambulance came and took me. And, uh, yeah, wish that I didn't do that. <laughs> I met Breaker through Cannonball. And then I started training with them in um, Les Morgan's furniture shop in New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget, I was wrestling Breaker. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Diego DeMarco was wrestling Breaker in training. And Breaker's kid just started crying. And I'm like, don't worry, I'll save your dad. And I did a run-in during their practice match just to calm the kid down. <laughs> and I have so many Breaker stories. Oh, my God. Uh, we were wrestling SWO once. We were the first match of the night. I had brought him in there. They didn't know him, uh, Wolfman and all those people. Yeah. And uh, as you know from the Battle World days, I can't throw a working punch to save my life. So if you're my friend, I tend to be stiffer because you, you know my situation. So he had his head down, and I punched him really hard in the top of the head. And like you said, the long hair, he throws his head back. You stiff motherfucker. Right in the middle of the ring. And Dude, do you know what's funny? Um, Breaker and I, Breaker and I had a match against each other in DCW, and we were we were told no blood, no one was allowed to gig, and we we called a spot where like I ran him into the post and and we hard hard way, but he for sure he for sure gigged, but he was like he was like fucking haul off and punch me, just fucking hard punch me right in the, right in the head, and I was like. I'm doing it and I'm feeling really bad because I'm hitting him. I'm giving I'm potato in his head like hard. Right. And he's like, God, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still I still think about it. I'm like, ah, I didn't want to have to potato my friend so hard. Now you mentioned gigging. I never intentionally gigged, but I bled quite often. Um, and one time it was before the match even started. Uh, I was in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, World Star Wrestling Federation. Uh, as I was making my way to the ring, the lights went out. I had my clipboard in my hand, and I'm trying to climb through the ropes, and I cut myself with the metal hold on the clipboard before the match started. 
<laughs> Another time, I gigged in a match I wasn't even in. I was doing um, a pull apart in WPW with um, Sinister X and Molson. And they're throwing these big arms over us. And Sinister's Anthony, his elbow hits me in the back of the head um, and opened me up for four stitches I had to yeah, get. Hard, hard way. He Sinister felt so X, bad and he sat with me all night. And uh, what a but, sweet yeah, guy, dude. Well, I, yeah. I, I haven't seen him in years. I still see him posted in certain shows up in that area. But uh, I don't know why he never made it. He, I mean, he had the look. He had the size. It's, I know he had some issues with driving. I, I think it, I think I think it was probably some sort of like age thing. Could be, yeah. Most likely, most likely, it had to do with his advanced age. Could be, yeah. I I, I guess because I was older at that point, I didn't notice <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, dude, you 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 were you were ancient to me at when you were thirty three years old, and I was like, oh, look at this old guy. I'm like, 33 is young. 33 is young. Wow. <laughs> I had a match at 55. I I think um I think, um, I think I'm gonna go till I'm 50, and then I'm gonna hang them up. I well, I, I mean, I I've been I've been speaking about this for a couple months now. Just just to, to my to my loved ones, just my my close friends and family and stuff, saying like. I will. Okay, uh, here I am. It just it just hit the anniversary of that battle royal, right? It just hit the twentieth anniversary of that battle royal that we were both in. That was my first match as Corey Castle. My first appearance using the name Corey Castle was there. Uh, so twenty years. Uh, I'm thirty eight years old. Uh, I never uh, earned a living off of wrestling. I've never had wrestling as my main income. I mon I've never monetized my wrestling career. But I would say if I get to the point where I'm at 50 <laughs> and I still never monetize, I don't, I don't see, I don't see that as a, I don't see that as an option to me, me getting that old and never having made it. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's the difference between you and I. I had an established job at that point. Um, I just wanted to live out my dreams. Um, I never, whenever somebody said, oh, are you a professional? I would always, it's my glorified hobby. Um, yeah, some people golf. Some people golf. Yep, that's just the thing that I like to do. It's been part of my life since I was 10 years old. So uh, it's the most consistent thing in my life. It's like, I... I'm an expert at it. I'm an, I have the ways that I can can expertly analyze it. And like I've spent more time of my life doing this and being part of this and loving this than I've spent not doing this. Right. So I I mean I, I don't see I kind of I don't see it as my my job for sure, but it's like for sure, this is this has been a hobby for forever, and I used to shame the word hobby as far as referring to uh, being a wrestling enthusiast. I would say that me calling it a hobby was was like a like a red flag to me. Like I, it would trigger me. I would get upset about that. But like yeah. it's it's so pay to play. It's just like a hobby. The wrestling, the independent wrestling, is so ridiculously pay to play that there's no other way to refer to it other than saying hobby. I remember my buddy Cage got really angry at me and some other people the other night, uh, the other night, 15 years ago. Uh, <laughs> the other night, couple years ago. We would work a match for free and we he would always say that people like us are ruining it for people like him who are trying to make a career out of it. And I'm like, Aren't I entitled to have fun? I mean, hey, hey, uh, can I, can I, uh, can I, can I, uh, also not, not to shit on Cage because I love the guy. I, Chuck, Chuck's my bud. But like when I was coming back, when I was coming back to the wrestling business after having this craniotomy and I was trying to get booked places, this one company that I was trying to work for in PA, I forget what it was called, but I knew that like 
uh, Lance was there. Lance Anawai was there. And Craig was Craig was refing for them, my friend Craig. And uh, he brought me there. I, I met the I met the promoter and uh, and and this is this is gonna be the first time I've I've dropped the names of it. Um, but the guy asked me what I wanted to get paid, and he said, Why would I pay you that when Cage and his partner come here from Rochester, New York for twenty dollars? Was the partner uh, Rob? I be green. No. They traveled together. They were quite a. No, it was it was after it was after uh, Ivy Green. Ah, okay. So that the him, him team with Ivy was was like a little sooner like a little than sooner. that. Uh, yeah, a little earlier than that. Earlier. But he had he had moved on to a different tag partner. Mm -hmm. And their tag team, twenty dollars for both of them, and they bought themselves a hotel room. So they would drive themselves in. So you can't you can't say that you're that someone's ruining the business for other people when you're actively doing it for people like me who have yeah. lots to risk. Risk versus reward, pay to play. You're you're uh blackballing me accidentally. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I that was definitely. something I was I was a little pissed was, about too. Yeah. So to hear that, that yeah. it's funny. funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, he was intense, and he thought every match was an audition for WWE. And if you had one bad match, you didn't want to, or even if he had it with someone else, you didn't want to be in the locker room afterwards. What's weird, and it took me a long time to discover it. It took me, I mean, I'm still discovering it, that not every match at every moment is going to be perfect. I get it like a WWE is so overly produced and it seems like everything's so perfect and everything's caught around in a certain way. But it's like the business looks more like a shoot when there are some mistakes. Yeah. Like look at the Attitude Era. Watch that shit back. There's mistakes here and there all the time. But nowadays, like they edit around them and they and they're like they, it's it's uh, it's. Wrestling isn't supposed to be so perfect. Wrestling yeah, not about that. Right. It's not supposed to look so perfect. Steve, have you done a lot of podcasts? Have you been guests on a lot of people's podcasts? Actually, yeah. Um, quite a few. Um, trying to think of the names. <laughs> no, you don't have to think I of the names. I did one for uh, Kenny Casanova last week. Okay. Um, I did one for... Ross Eichen, who who's affiliated with um, Slam Wrestling, I believe. Well, the reason uh, I was asking that part, and I did, I don't need the names or anything, but I was saying like all the podcasts that you've been on. What is the one question you've never been asked that you have wanted to be asked on a podcast? Oh wow! Because I usually get asked the same question by everyone yeah. about my uh, WPW Roller Derby match, which Rick was <laughs> I was there. Who I was there for that. Oh my god! With the crappy the clown. Uh, oh yes, I, I bumped to toilet paper. <laughs> but I, in all fairness, I bumped to silly string against doink ones too. So cool. Oh, what have I not been asked? Uh, I don't know. I I, I have to think about that. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, I what? don't know. I don't know <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you the opportunity at this point to think while, while you're thinking about that, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity since I, I, something super important to me, the, the ability to say things on the record and to know that the things that we're saying are going to outlive us. So this, this conversation with you and I, me telling you about how important you've been to my journey, how 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 much respect and love that I have for you, uh, th that that kind of stuff is on the record. So in twenty years from now, we can listen back to this and we can we can know that 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 exists. Uh, 
True. That recording exists. I want to give you the opportunity to say to me anything or ask me anything that you'd like to ask me. And uh, and just kind of spin it on the you're you're the host for a minute. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh What was the most rewarding thing or event that happened in your wrestling career? Um, it, it's it's a, it's a strange one, dude. Uh, I I I don't think I don't think you even um, were around when this happened to me. It's been eleven years now since I since I returned to the ring after uh, after this brain surgery. Yeah. So like they cut my head all the way across like that. I got a big scar under here. So um, I returned to wrestling. And this is, this is, um, this is not a thing I talk. I, I mean, I've talked about it on here a few times. But um, the night that I came back to wrestling. Sure. The night that I came back to wrestling after that 13 months uh, of staying away from it. The, the the first show back was a WPW show at the Reading Phillies Arena, um, but it also happened to be it also happened to be uh, Rick, my best friend Rick's uh, his his last match. That was his retire like that was the same night. So I can I wrestled Ray earlier in the show, and Matt Bomboy and Rick were wrestling each other, and that was both that was their both of their last matches for WPW. And it was my first match back to, to WPW. So it was almost like a ship's passing in the night situation. Yeah. yeah. And when I came back to the locker room after the match was over, I ran far away and and was uh, crying to myself over <laughs> over underneath the bleachers because <laughs> I was happy. I was I was excited to be back and it was a, really emotional. And Bomboy came up to me. Bomboy came back to me. He came up to me and he was like you're back, dude. You're back. And I was like, get away from me. I ran away because I knew you'd come up to me. I just need to be alone for a minute. And I also, I also didn't want to steal the glory of my friends. Like those, yeah. were, those, are, those are, and still are two of my best friends that I've ever had in this world. And th that was a special moment for them. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to cry, get my tears all over it. That's very mature of you. <laughs> I came over here to get away from you specifically. Because I'm not trying to steal your thunder. I, I think for me, it's when um, promoters uh, would say nice things about me to the rest of the locker room. Um, I had one incident where um, Harley Watkins had booked me. We had wrestled on shows together. He was running a show. I think it was Hanover, Pennsylvania or something like that. I don't know. But as I walked in, he broke into a speech about Steve is a veteran in this business. And whatever he tells you to do, you make believe it's coming from me. You do it. You don't ask. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And what was even surprised was Cage was in that locker room. And he, he's got many years over me. And I'm like, <laughs> it really shocked me. And then, of course, I ended the show. It was the main event. And I put over his uh, nephew who was doing a like 140-pound Undertaker gimmick. Well, well, I mean, you got you gotta you gotta butter the guy up if you're gonna ask him to do the job to your nephew. I, I, I mean, I know I told you those two stories about me um, changing the finish, but um, I, it was never about that for me. It was always about making both of us look strong. And even in China, I was offered by the promoter squash him in two minutes, and I said no, I refuse. I, I don't do that. I said, he needs to come back next month. I need to come back next month. And uh, if I can do some cheap little cheap, trip him on the ropes or put my foot on the rope, whatever it takes, where we both look like either of us could have won. Well, that's that's part of also like the the becoming a draw mentality. So if you go like, what are the what is the motivation for the people to want to come back next time and see it happen if this already this squashed already this happened already in minutes and it, it didn't mean anything like we gotta ha we gotta give them a reason to want to come back and see it again next time and also I, I had a similar thing with um tommy cairo uh in 
Force One. Um, Big Slam has put me over at that point. I think my record against him was 0-17. And um, so that night it became 0-18. Show up for the next show, and he goes, Steve made that guy look like gold. Rematch, Steve goes over in front of the locker room. There was other uh, explicit language, but I did. Did Walt it. put you over? Yeah, um, but again, I wanted everyone to look strong. So I, I had uh, Jimmy Clydesdale as my manager. I had him distract him. All right. And then I went to the, uh, the, the small package. Dude, it's, the, it, it's really sad to know that like half of the people in our stories are not with us any longer. At least. Yeah. yeah. Wrestle wrestlers have a have a short lifespan, huh? Yeah, and you know it's funny you say that because I was just watching a YouTube video today called The Ultimate Sacrifice, where it was two hours of deaths in the ring. Why would you watch that? You watch people die in the ring? In some cases they showed it, other cases they just described it or showed you other footage of him working. I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to watch that. <laughs> yeah, I mean it wasn't it wasn't like brutal or anything. It was mostly heart attacks, but right. This just still. Yeah, it's like and there's one guy in England who had two people die, two opponents die. So that was kind of weird. It's such a risk. It's such a risk. The thing that like we've already sacrificed, like. Birthdays, Christmases, holiday, you know what I mean? Like weddings, funerals, like we've already sacrificed all that. Like give up a lot of what our life is to pay to play in wrestling. But it's all for this being a mark and marking out for your own self. But it's like if we're already doing that sacrifice and then and then like a good amount of us don't live past a certain age it's 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 but you know, uh, part of it is, and this is an unpopular opinion that i've expressed but a lot of times it's a um you gotta know your limitations yeah well, um, like i mean there's also i mean dude the 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 pain medicine the the alcoholism the the the, the many vices that come along with the the type of punishment that you put your body through yeah. No, I, I understand that. But at the same time, one thing that always bothered me was people asking me to pay the GoFundMe for some 18-year-old kid who dove off the second-story balcony through a flaming table onto concrete for six fans. And I'm like, you know, I didn't tell you to do that. Right. And a lot of people don't like me for that, but there there are choices, too. And I mean, like knowing your limitations, this guy in China was calling uh, for this really fast paced lucha spot. And I'm like, I'm 53, man. I, I can't do that. I said, just let me do what I know I can do, and then we'll both look good. And he didn't understand. So we did the spot, and it looked horrible. <laughs> he didn't understand that I can't of it? Um, Speaking of what you said before about being marks for yourself, a lot of these, the kids in China, kids, and I use that word carefully, um, they don't have any sense of etiquette or protocol. And I've been trying, I've been harping on that for a long time. And a lot of them are playing like they're in a video game. And I've told people in the middle of the ring when they hit me with a, um, well, hit me is the wrong word, when they throw, a super kick, and it's a foot and a half away from me, I don't sell it. If you hit me with the wussiest chop in the world, I'll, I'll, in character, I'll look at the guy, hit me again. What's funny, man, I just did, Um, I was doing watch-alongs uh, on this on this streaming app that I just downloaded called Wisdom, and uh, I was watching, I was watching uh, AEW and NXT from last night, like this morning, well, I got well, I got home from work this morning, and I knew I wanted to kill a little bit of time before you and I had to before you and I had to connect up. So I didn't want to I didn't want to I didn't want to fall asleep. 
So I, I got in and I was doing that. And I was like, yeah, some of these matches are just, there's no consequence to anything. Like there's no storytelling in these spots. They're just moves for the sake of moves. Just like you're playing a 2K video game. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's why, I mean, people who are putting people through tables and the guy gets up and goes right back into the next move, like doesn't even register that he's gone through a flaming table. Well, I, I was saying the fact that, like, these people just take chops and don't even sell them with their face. They take moves and then don't even sell them, don't act like they hurt at all. It's like, it's like, that's, that's kind of not fair. Like yeah. dude's selling for you. Exactly. Yeah. I, I had one guy in China. Actually, he was an, um, a Mexican American tall guy who uh, did that. And I'm like, man, you're not the undertaker. You know, at least register it on your face. Show that you're angry that I did it. Mm -hmm. If it didn't hurt you, don't deadpan me. Well, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't sell your stomps cause I didn't feel them. 20 enough. years ago, 20 years ago, I didn't sell your stomps because I didn't feel them. I forgive you. <laughs> What's that? You're forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was hoping you weren't holding that against me when I heard you say earlier, oh, they look good, but the guy didn't sell them. I'm like, ah. I thought you were, Never I thought Never you were shooting on, on Jersey Reinvasion, Battle Royal. And especially at that point when I was so green that, like I said, you were at the school before me. So whatever you did was right and whatever I did was wrong. And I don't mean that sarcastically. That was my approach at that point. Did you know that I was a virgin at that time? <laughs> I, was, I was such a nerd. I, oh, you'd, you'd, you'd think to look at me that I was a, a handsome, pretty boy, but... Uh, Nobody liked me. I didn't. I didn't get girls until after I was already Corey Castle and on shows and shit. Uh -huh. I, uh, I, I never uh, got any female attention based on my <laughs> wrestling of any kind for any reason. Well, you were already married. You were already way married. Uh, at that point, yeah. <laughs> you were already way married. Went down the the tubes eventually. It came to an end. Oh. After 19 years. Okay, so you're remarried now. Yep. And for as much hardship that I endured over that time and <sighs> depression and suicide attempts, this might be a scoop for you. Um, the way everything worked out, I wouldn't change a thing. Steve, what do you think happens when you die? Ah, uh, that's another good question of yours. Um, I'd like to think that there is some kind of reward, a, a resting place, um, open to all religions, um, where people can live in harmony. But uh, unfortunately, I, I tend to be cynical about things like that, uh, always hoping for the best. You never know, because if you're wrong, George Carlin did a, a whole routine about people who uh, believed in religion just in case their <laughs> negative <laughs> fallback plan. Yeah, basically. George Carlin, George Carlin, George uh, such a prophet, such a prophet. And like when you look at the, the coronavirus and lockdowns yeah. and the crazy Trump shit, like all this stuff, you're like, oh man, I wish George Carlin was here to commentate this weird world that we're in at this moment but all this yeah. stuff he said is the evergreen and it still it still applies if you were to apply it in any of the 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 wacky few years that we've had uh but there's and a little, little, little stuff that he talked about um i always enjoy his uh description of your stomach rumbling it was definitely not his typical Politics and religion and right. anti-materialism. So I got I got just a, uh, just a few more things for you, and then I'll send you off into the I'll send you off into the sunset with a hot dog and a handshake. <laughs> just so, like the good old days. Just like the good old days. 
two hot dogs. My price is two hot dogs. <laughs> so, uh, I do this. I do this segment every show called Audio Time Travel. Okay, so I got, we talk, talked about earlier with you how this 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 communication, this interview, this conversation, this podcast, this episode, this is outliving us both. Uh, I say, take yourself in the next minute and you're speaking directly to your grandchildren who stumble across this recording in 2042. You're speaking directly to them in an audio time travel. What messages are you giving them in order to help them evolve? Oh, well, this one is easy for me to answer because um, I'm living proof of it. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do what you want to do. You can't achieve your dreams. Um, the only thing that's stopping you is yourself. And it really holds true for me because, uh, I mean, against all odds, at 34, having my first match, um, and I never thought – I mean, I'm not saying I'm a superstar by any stretch of the imagination, but would you have thought I would be a 10-time world champion? <laughs> With my C-minus talents – with my uh, A presentation is what I used to, between the um, the mic work, the promos, connecting with the audience. I, I always build myself as that. C minus <laughs> with uh, an A plus ability uh, to get over. And, and that only works in certain types of promotions, like the old school stuff. I oh, would yeah. never have had any kind of success in CZW. I mean, they would have tore me up. Bro. Like, while while working in front of smart fans is good, I'll I'll take shindy fans who don't understand, don't understand the inner working of the wrestling. I'm fine with that because they they suspend their disbelief and enjoy themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I've had fans. Um, what was Quarrytown, Pennsylvania? I did a show there. Um, some lady took pictures with me. I do another show for another fed six years later, same building. There she is with all the pictures posted on a collage. And I made that much difference in your life that you saved this for six years. You know, what's weird. I always misspell the word. I always misread the word collage as college. And I, I mean, also this- always misread the word uh, message for massage. Uh, um, right there with you. And ever I'll, since I'll, I've been out of the country, my, my skills are diminishing. I, I have to spell check everything. And, and I'm the one who gets on people about that. I'll, I'll read I'll read a sentence that says, that says John Cena has special massage for make a wish kids. And I'm like, ah, didn't yeah. you watch the documentary about Michael Jackson? Ah. Yeah. My English skills are, eroding so the, the way we wrap up every show is a i say hypothetically i've gifted you yeah. the show and this episode has been your first episode your pilot episode to evolving with steve the teacher in a very jerry springer's final thought type of way uh you wrap it up in a in a pretty little bow with the best takeaways from this conversation and also, if you can remember, uh, if you can also remember the the question that you wish that you'd been answered, you'd been asked. Uh, yeah, no, no luck with that one. Uh, <laughs> um, but overall, I mean, it was good times back then. It, it was all new and exciting, and uh, I was getting to do things. I mean, I, I never stepped into a ring uh, before that first training session. And I'm bumping and running the ropes. And and I just, I was an open book and I trusted everyone. And if Zandig told me to do a flip off the top rope, I didn't question it. I just did it. And uh, I remember a couple weeks in when Dahmer was practicing the backdrops on us. And they had like the crash pad. And I'm like, well, why do we need that? And So I fully trusted that the people in charge knew what they were doing. And they've done it before. And there's no way I can get hurt. I I would love to run a wrestling school the way that John Dahmer run, ran a wrestling school. 
I, I want that exact, exact, exact formula for that. I, I would say like I've spent all this time in wrestling and I've never trained anybody from the ground up. It's something I, I've always kind of wanted. I was given that opportunity. What is that? I was given that opportunity in the Philippines. Um, I was going to do a show here. I was booked for it. And they, um, they told me, well, we can't afford to bring you in. And this was when I was in China. Now I'm in the Philippines. And, oh, could you teach some seminars or even a regular weekly class? I said, well, you're an eight-hour bus ride away from me. Um, and there is no airplane access. Uh, I said, but I would do it. And then they said, well, uh, like as the show approached, we don't have the money. I said, well, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for the bus. I'll pay for the hotel. Um, all I ask is that you give me the show. The most recent one is September 11th. Uh, not that that date is significant for the reasons everyone thinks. But um, I said, by September 1st, please give me all the information so I can make the arrangements. I need time to make the arrangements. Plus, I get my pension check on the 1st. So that's when I have the most money available to do such a thing. And I asked them three or four times. And um, they just never got back to me. And here, all of a sudden, September 13th, I'm still sitting here. And I'm seeing the show on Facebook. And it, it really hurt. I mean, I really wanted to. The etiquette in all of Asia is horrible. Uh, my friend, who I mentioned before, Big Sam from England, his explanation is that there's no adults in any of the locker rooms. These are just kids behaving like kids, doing anything to get themselves over. Um, they don't shake That's hands. That's Asia, man. That's everywhere. That's everywhere. It's the, the, the thing was, the wrestling business used to be set up like it was it was uh, a mafia. adult male, males who could who would scare you because they were violent individuals. Like if you if you held up an exact comparison to the attitude era versus today, like you would be like, Yeah, I could beat up any one of these guys. But if you look back at the attitude era, you're like, Yeah, I would not touch. I would not start anything with any of these people. Like the, the thing about the thing about wrestling, it seems like it seems like the saying was always if it was easy, anybody would do it. And then they were like, okay, let's let anybody do it. And you can thank social media for that. Yep. So it, it appears like it's easy when it's fucking not at all. Yeah. It is but not. But even courtesies, shaking hands. Um don't leave until the show is over. Help with the ring if you're needed. Uh, the heel calls the match. The veteran calls the match. Or like at least leads the match. Yeah. Um, I had one guy, that same guy with the broken ankle. I wrestled him again, and he didn't call one spot for me. He had the whole. They they know they're going to wrestle me weeks before I know, and they come into the venue with the whole match planned out. With the guy gave me no shine in the whole match. I, I'm like, no, no, no. I'm taking my shine. Either you're going to cooperate or I'm taking it. I'm taking my shine is the name yeah. of this episode. <laughs> do you do any impressions, yeah. Steve? Uh, very few. Uh, I do What's a your very best impression? Few. I'm sorry? What's your best impression? Uh, Gilbert Godfrey doing Seinfeld. Okay. Can you do Gilbert Godfrey... Doing Seinfeld, but say the catchphrase to, to close out the show, which we always use, is be fun, have safe, keep evolving. Be fun, have safe, keep evolving. That's not my my strength, my any strength to imagine. I just think about the routine with the people on the bus. Who are these people on the bus, and where did they get exact change? <laughs> Steve. Um, it's, this has been a pleasure, dude. I, 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 I appreciate us catching up and next time you're, next time you're in the States, next time you come home, hit me up, bro. Anytime you need a friend, anytime you, you feel like you got nobody to talk to, I'm always here, man. I appreciate that. Uh, it does get lonely over here. <laughs> yeah, just absolutely. Absolutely. Feel free to hit me up anytime, man. I, you're going to be sorry you said that. <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and that, that that really goes for anybody who's like 
spend any spend any time listening to this or watching this. Uh, let me know you exist. Leave a comment on the YouTube on the YouTube video. Uh, if if like I said, if 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 you also feel like you've got nobody to talk to, reach out to me. I'm not a hard person to get in touch with. I mean, my DMs are wide open. And that's be kind. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to, to everyone, else. everyone else. Be fun. Have safe. Keep evolving. Thank you. Thank you.